How's it going, folks? We should be live. Um, yep, okay, cool. I see numbers coming through. I see chat. <clears throat> Just made it. I'm a uh, Baishu or Shiro Yuki, possibly. Uh, Monica, good seeing you. All right, guys. And yeah, it looks like there's a good number of people here, so that's great. Um, so thanks for coming to the live stream. Of course, today we've got our, our guest, Brendan O'Kane, which some of you guys will know. Um, you know, he, he taught our uh, intro to pre-modern Chinese literature course last year, uh, which was super popular. And <clears throat> a lot of people really enjoyed it and asked me if we could, uh, um, you know, do another course with Brendan. And so since this uh, novelty, Jinping Mei, is sort of his specialty, we thought kind of, you know, what better course to do than that. So um, it be alive. It is. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm going to bring Brendan on in just a minute. Uh, for those of you who don't know Brendan, um, you know, some of you will be new since the last time we did a live stream with, uh, live stream with Brendan. Uh, we'll do a little, you know, let him talk about himself, his background learning Chinese and things like that, how he got into Chinese literature. Um, yeah, so that'll be fun. And we'll talk about the novel itself. And then he's got a presentation, uh, that he's going to do sort of an intro to, uh, Jinping Mei. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let me bring him on. Uh, here we go. Oh, I think I had you on the list. Hey. Good having you, man. And, uh, just for everyone oh, watching. Good to be here. It is going to be, uh, Brendan's video is going to be a little pixelated. We figured out recently that uh, the software that I use for live streaming is not very good when it comes to having guests on. So uh, sorry about the pixelation. His slides should be just fine. Um, yeah. And honestly, you are really not missing anything with my face to begin with. So, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, we'll figure out uh, something for future live streams with guests because, it, yeah, it just it ought to be better than this. So. Um, Randy, good seeing you, man. I th believe you guys know each other. Hey, Randy. How's it going? And also, hello to Hakuyuki. Good to see you again. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I haven't got the window up, so I'm not sure who else is here. I, I mean, it may well be. You never asked. Yeah, could have, you know, I had a suspicion that it was Haku, but then I, yeah, I forgot, of course, the reading of buys. I mean, that's just my, my sinocentrism uh, <laughs> intruding. <laughs> Go for the the, the Sino Japanese, yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay. Well, um, yeah. For people who don't know you, can you talk a little about who is Brendan O'Kane and uh, how did you get into learning Chinese, and specifically, you know, the yeah. field of late imperial uh, Chinese literature? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, who I am is kind of a heavy question, but. Um, the short version is I'm uh, a translator and uh, you know student enthusiast, uh, general enjoyer of um, of Chinese literature in general. Um, uh, in another life, I lived in Beijing and worked as a translator of contemporary fiction and film. Um, and then I escaped and went to grad school and spent a bunch of time in the 17th century, uh, which is where well we're kind of right on the border between the 16th and the 17th here, but uh, it's it's not a bad place to spend time. Um, that Ming-Qing transition, is, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and it's where a lot of the kind of, the, the things that will uh, lay the groundwork for what we call modern literature um, start to come to the fore during this. And Jinping Mei actually plays a really key role in that process, as I'll, I'll get to. Um, but I got into uh, either late imperial Chinese literature or early modern Chinese literature, these things where which term you use probably says a lot about you. Um, I'm not sure what. Um, but I got into Ming and Qing fiction anyway um, for a few reasons. One, uh, if you read Mandarin, it's not that hard to read this stuff. It's written in something that is, you know, it's not quite Mandarin as we know it, but it's getting there. You can see the language sort of becoming. Um, 
But it's also uh, a really interesting time because it's before the trauma of the 19th century. It's before the, you know, uh, the opium wars, it's before the boxers, it's before the just the god awful horrors of the first half of the 20th century and the second half, which was not that great either. Um, and so it, it's a chance to kind of read Chinese fiction, Chinese literature, as written by people who don't think they're worse than anybody else yet. And there's something really, really wonderful. Um, and on top of that, uh, I ended the intro to pre-modern Chinese lit course with a sampling of Hong Lo Meng, uh, mm -hmm. the story of the stone or the of red mansions. And that is, I think, um, the language and the tradition really at their best. Um, well, I don't know about best, but it, it is the most of something that it will ever be. Um, Jin Ping Mei, again, is kind of a, a key cornerstone of that, uh, one that is not really noted or, or acknowledged. Um, as for where I got into Jinping Mei originally, um, well, I, I had heard of it. Uh, I think a lot of people have. And I'd heard uh, you know, that it was super pornographic. And I thought, oh, yeah, the Ming Dynasty, well, it's going to be two people you know, led into the same room without a chaperone. Um, no, as it turns out, no. Uh, the book was written to shock. It still retains that power very much. Um, there will be, I, I actually don't know how broad a trigger warning I can put on the entire court, um, but it is quite explicit. It is quite fun. Mm. Um, and it's a book that has, uh, you know, reputationally um, a lot of weight to carry, right? There's, um, in some ways, it's seen as kind of a, a mark of the decadence of the late. Um, it's known as a, a wicked book. Even as we'll see the, the prefaces to this book, the very first sentence is, Jinping Mei is an obscene book. Um, and yet, it's 100 chapters long, and the sect is less than 1% of it. Uh, there must be something else going on. And it turns out that there is. There's quite a lot of it. Uh, this is a book that doesn't get taught a lot for various reasons. The content. Um, but it's really, really important to the development of Chinese fiction. Uh, I think of it as kind of the dark matter of early modern Chinese literature. Uh, you can see its influence in just about everything that comes after it, but it almost can't be acknowledged today. Scholars will, but uh, your middle school textbooks, your high school textbooks, your Chinese teacher uh, generally will. Uh, Brendan, I think um, <clears throat> there may be uh an issue with a microphone, if you could maybe get a little closer. It's just, it tends to come. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, oh, dang. Uh, yes. Let me it, see. It just is something I noticed. So I, I think we were um, able to hear pretty much everything you said. But So, yeah. So you, you've said that it's um, sort of the dark matter of later Chinese fiction in that, uh, you know, everyone's read it, but nobody will admit it, basically. And you can see the influence, but. <laughs> It was also influenced by, uh, you, you, you've told me it's sort of started out as fanfic. Is that right? Almost, yeah. It, uh, you know, it takes as its starting point this episode from uh, the novel Outlaws of the Marsh or mm. The Water Margin or All Men Are Brothers, The Marshes of Mount Liang. It has a bunch of titles. Uh, yeah, Shui Shui. Um, and it's an episode that comes between chapters, I think, 23 and 27, um, in which the hero Wu Song, uh, having just beaten a tiger to death, uh, which some people may remember from the pre-modern lit course, uh, visits this town, uh, runs into his older brother, uh, who has married a bad woman. And in Shui Hu Zhuan, um, you know, he, he enacts pretty bloody revenge on her, uh, in, uh, on her and her lover, uh, Ximan Qin. Uh, but in Jin Ping Mei, um, it goes another way. It's like an alternate universe version of that episode from Shui Hu. And, uh, it, you know, it's written inside this, but it is so far beyond uh, Shui Hu or anything else that comes before it in terms of complexity, scope, or, or depth. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, almost reminds me of, uh, well, this is probably way off, but uh, I always enjoy like 
I'm a fan of Tarantino movies, and I sort of enjoy his alternate take on historical events, or sort of uh, mm. rewrite that so that it doesn't work out as horribly as it did in reality, uh, or so that the get yeah. the, the revenge sort of thing. <clears throat> um, I, I, yeah, there's uh, you know there, there's a little bit of rewriting history here, but of course this is you know. This is a, a, a literate Chinese male writing for other literate Chinese males. So it's also history as warning, right? Shui mm-hmm. Huzhuan is set at the end of the Northern Song Dynasty. Uh, and for anybody reading during the Ming Dynasty, well, they know what happened to the Northern Song Dynasty. Yeah. Uh, and so underlying everything else is this knowledge that like the society being depicted here is terminal. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, we've got a, question from yuki who is disappointed in my japanese um oh no but he uh uh or haku i should say um so he says not (laughs) not hard to read the amount of start stops i've done trying to read those texts is embarrassing yeah i'm i'm uh probably overstating the case a bit um I, i should say that you know compared to I don't know, compared to like Tang Dynasty, Chi, something like that, uh, something that's written in Wenyan. Mm-hmm. These are written more or less in, you know, something fairly close to modern Mandarin. Um, but another nice thing about the early novels, uh, as I will be saying in a moment, is that uh, most of them uh, come out of the oral tradition. And so you can totally like get recordings of the old storyteller doing ping shu of Sanguo or Xioji or whatever, and get uh, you know not the same experience as reading the book, but an experience fairly close to what one of the early knowers of that story would have had. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, we have a few people who so just right before our uh, live stream started, there was a. The middle Chinese, uh, middle period Chinese history course just uh, finished their lesson, oh, and they were talking about Neo Confucianism. Uh, it's so awesome. A few people showing up, and they've got Neo Confucianism. Head. Um, oh man! Is there any connection? Well, uh, you know what's going on. There in- actually is. Uh, there, there very much is, and uh, this is something that I'll, I will do a whole spiel on uh, later during one of the kind of background segments. Um, but yeah, uh, right around the end of the 16th century, the start of the 17th, um, there's this, I don't want to say a battle between two forms of Neo-Confucianism, but there are two strains. The one is the orthodox form, Chengzhu. Uh, this is what you have to learn for the exams. It's what you have to parrot. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also uh, Xinxue the school of the mind or the school of the heart. Um, this derives from uh, Lu Jiuyuan and Wang Yongming. And uh, it ends up becoming the basis for some really, uh, I would say individualistic uh, thinking. Um, that is not what underlies this book, but you can see it in the, the works of, um, uh, of people who read and, and were early promoters of this, Feng Menglong being a, a big one. Um, and yeah, actually, something on the uh, the criticisms of the school of the mind would be helpful background for reading some parts of this book. I think. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, those uh, those parts of the history course I think always tend to be some of the favorites. Of, you know, talking about the intellectual history. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I love nerd fights. <laughs> Yeah, and then we've also been uh, talked a little bit about Neo Confucianism, also in the classical, advanced classical Chinese we're doing, right? Last week. Ooh, we that's read, tougher going. Yeah, well, we, we read uh, Han Yu last week, who was uh, okay. sort of, you know, uh, early or possibly even, I guess, a precursor uh, to Neo Confucianism. Yeah, proto Neo. Yeah, proto Confucianism, uh, yeah. And then. Uh, this week was um, Ouyang Xiu. It was a little, a little different, a little mm. but then we've got um, Su oh, cool. next week. So, um, nice. yeah, Su Shi, boy, the um, uh, on like on Neo Confucianism, I love uh, looking at the 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 Wang An Shi fight. 
right? Because you've got, you know, Confucian on Confucian deathmatch. And, you know, everybody there is, everybody there is well-educated. Everybody has read the same text. Everybody is citing the same text for arguments. And they've just got completely different, completely incompatible uh, worldviews. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, they were actually... Uh... And, uh, uh, oh, good. Oh, uh, are you going to be doing a uh, leecher in that class as well? Um, no, I don't think so. Let me, I forget. Ah, there, uh, there's one text I can't remember. It, it's the one that you recommended to me, but I forget who the author was. Um, oh, uh, maybe Zhang Dai. Or... Uh, yeah, yeah, Zhang, Zhang Dai. Yeah. Nice. But, yeah, we're getting to lead you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been a fun class. And actually, people have started to notice, like Bernard mentioned yesterday, he was like, these, these texts are getting closer and closer to modern Chinese. Because we started off the, the course with yeah. like Zuo Zhuan and Shang Shu and things mm -hmm. like that. And then now we're getting into, you know, sort of uh, late first millennium, second millennium stuff. And it's like, oh, this is, this seems way more familiar. <laughs> totally, yeah. And, you know, when you get into like... Um... Uh, discourse records, right? Like uh, Yu Lu, uh, which you get from Chan or, or from uh, Zhu Xi or whatever. Like that's the speech of the time, and you know it's not. It, it, it's like Martian Chinese, something like like you can tell what's going on. It's not classical. It's not quite Mandarin, but it's definitely, it's definitely in the family. And it's kind yeah, of neat I, to see. Yeah, I noticed that too when I. Um... Like after I had learned a decent amount of classical Chinese and my, my modern Chinese was getting, you know, good enough that I was working as a translator and stuff. And I, I had always wanted to one of, you know, one of the big four. And so I picked up a copy of Sanguo Yin Yi and I read like the first chapter or something. And it was like, oh man, this is like, I can read this. this is so cool. Because a few years before that. Yeah. And it did, I mean, it really felt like, uh, a sort of weird mishmash of uh, Mandarin, classical Chinese, and then sort of other. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. And uh, I mean, what's cool about Sanguo is that is probably the most classical of all of the kind of major uh, masterworks or, or whatever. Um, you know, if you read Shui Hu, uh, that's, I mean, it's still, it still has kind of classical apparatus i guess but it's closer to the spoken language um sanguo was uh, i think there's an article a while ago about uh, you know some people in the ming using that actually for like teaching uh classical chinese reading oh um, just... i have to look up that yeah I'll, I'll look up that reference i think maybe Anne mclaren so where is uh jinping mei on the on that spectrum Boy, Jinping Mei is, uh, at heart, it's Mandarin. Uh, at heart, it is uh, definitely uh, one of these Baihua novels. Mm -hmm. um, but it uses uh, pretty much the entire expressive repertoire of the Chinese language as of the end of the 16th century. So, you know, you have the story being told in Mandarin, but then you get all of these, like, buried quotations from drama or popular song, um, contracts, uh, popular encyclopedias, memorials, like you name it. Uh, it's it's just this kind of, uh, it's not even a mishmash, it's beautifully done, but um, it, it's this intricately pieced together collage or possible junk culture of uh, all of the things that Chinese could do. Oh, that's very cool. So it's really neat. Yeah. On, the, on the difficulty scale, like if people wanted to try to jump in and, and read some of it in Chinese, like how, uh, how much of a challenge is that going to be? Uh, it's going to be a challenge. Um, I would say, you know, by all means, give it a shot. Um, the text of Jinping Mei Tsihua that you'll find on Wikisource or ctext.org is it's pretty reliable version. Um, give it a shot. See what you think. Uh, the initial, uh, page or, or three uh, may be off-putting. There is a lot of poetry. And then there is kind of background explaining what poem you're doing in context. Um, but if you push through it and if you're kind of 
uh, comfortable skimming over, you know, skipping over words that you don't recognize or whatever. Yeah, you can do it. Um, that said, uh, you know, I know um, first language users of Chinese who are trained as historians of the Ming Dynasty who actually use the David Roy translation uh, as a reference just because it's faster. <laughs> I didn't realize they had it on C10. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the translation we're working with is... Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, there are a lot of Baudelarized uh, copies of it out there, um, mm -hmm. most print versions that you'll find. But yeah, C text and Wikisource, um, if you search for... Uh, I can't vouch for their text of the Chongzhen edition, but if you search for Jinping Mei Zihua, uh, or the Wan Li button, uh, you should find something that's a pretty reliable text. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've put a, a link in the chat for anyone who's uh, interested in checking that out. Cool. Well, uh, awesome. I, probably a good point to uh, transition and let you uh, bring up your slides and do your spiel. <clears throat> cool, cool, cool. Yes. Uh, let me get to it. Um, apologies in advance if there are any issues share window, but, um, you know, we... We persevere. We're very brave. Um, is that coming up? Yep. Cool. All right. So, um, yeah, I'll just dive into it. Uh, for anybody who's uh, studied Chinese literature or even Chinese language, you'll have been told about the four masterpieces of Chinese fiction, the Sida Mingzhu. Uh, this is a 20th century list. Um, and uh, we will talk later on about kind of how it came to be. But the four novels on this list are Sanguo, as John mentioned, uh, The Outlaws of the Marsh, or however you want to translate it, Shui Hu Zhuan, uh, Journey to the West, Xiu Ji, and then the Qing Dynasty novel, A Dream of Red Mansions, or The Story of the Stone, Hong Lo Meng. And if you think about these novels for a moment, there's something kind of funny uh, in this list. Um, Three Kingdoms. This is uh, this is very old. This is not really a novel as we think of it in English. It's a reworking of historical material. Um, it has several titles. One of them is the Sanguozhi Tongsu Yanyi, right? That is the uh, the popular moral explication of the records of the Three Kingdoms, uh, and it uh, takes as its base as quite of history material and then reworks that into fictional form. Uh, another th way in which this differs from uh, what we may think of when we hear novel is it, it doesn't really have an author. Um, yeah, there's a name attached to it, uh, Guanlong, but we don't really know who this is. We don't know anything about him. Uh, we don't even know what century uh, he lived in. Um, it's just a name that quite a lot of different things were attached to. Um, and so when we look at it today, yeah, we call it a novel, that's fine. Life is too short to really insist on precision, but uh, really it is a, a novelization of a story tradition, one that goes back centuries. The thing that we have today is the product of many, many different hands and different mouths. Um, something similar is the case with Shui Hu Zhuan. Uh, this is uh, the highly fictionalized uh, exploits of some bandits who lived around the end of the Northern Song. Um, it was the basis for stories even as far back as the Song Dynasty. During the Yuan, it's the basis for some terrifically violent, uh, at least the ones that survive. Uh, and as with Sanguo, the, the quote-unquote novel that we have, uh, is, you know, it's the result of quite a lot of different accretions and additions and subtractions and what have you. Um, there are several different editions of the novel currently circulating. Um, the only real reason that we have aim uh, for an author, Shunayan in this case, is um, in large part, at least because of the editor, Jin Shang Tan, who rewrote quite a lot of the book stealthily. Um, but this was another one that had Luo Guanzhong's name attached to it. So, you know, we can call it a novel, but it's a novel sort of in the way that a novel of Robin Hood would be, or a, a novelization of King Arthur. Um, 
although you know even with th white you've got one individual author's vision um with shui hu it's uh you know it's a tradition uh, or one facet of a tradition uh journey to the west uh i don't want to sound like a broken record i will just say that we've got some evidence of antecedents. Uh, there's actually a Korean language textbook, uh, the Nogolde, uh, which has a dialogue in it where uh, two Korean emissaries are in Beijing. One of them says, where are you going today? The other says, I'm going to buy books. The other says, are you going to buy Confucian classics? No, those are boring. I'm going to buy Journey to the West. It's fun. Um, again, uh, it's a tradition. The name that is attached to it, Wu Chengen, is, uh, I don't want to say an invention, but uh, we don't know that much about him. It's a 20th century attribution. And then we get to the 18th century novel, The Story of the Stone. This is a novel. This is not just a novel. This is a wonderful novel. This is one of the greatest novels that has ever been written in any language. And it is much more like what we think of when we talk about novels. There is one author, well, maybe two. Um, there's uh, a depiction of a, a kind of a realistic world with ordinary people doing ordinary things. They have ordinary psychology, ordinary motivations, quite detailed, in fact. Uh, it is terrifically realistic. And there is such a vast gulf in craft and sophistication, uh, technique, art, whatever you want to call it, between the first three of these novels and the fourth. And I think that uh, was one of the things that first made me, uh, I don't want to say suspicious, but first made me wonder uh, what this was, why they, uh, what had caused the, um, oh, sorry, I don't know if I knocked out video there. Um, what had caused this uh, abrupt jump in quality and sophistication and technique? Well, it is this, uh, the plum in the golden vase or Jinping Mei. Uh, on the left here, you may be able to see uh, there is a title page of uh, actually a later edition of this book that proclaims it the Yi Qi Chu, that is the number one most remarkable book. Uh, as I was saying to John, this is sort of written inside and around an episode from Shui Hu Zhuan. But again, it is far more novelistic. Uh, instead of historical heroes, instead of larger than life bandits, uh, mythological monkey kings, We've got ordinary life-size men and women doing ordinary life-size things, um, mostly pretty bad ordinary life-size things. Uh, right, so um, by way of summary, let me just jump back to um, my video feed here if I can. Um, hopefully. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so I will give you a quick overview of Jinping Mei. It tells the story of a squalid merchant named Ximen Qing. This is a figure who appears in the Shui Hu Zhuan story. Um, he is, uh, when we meet him, a well-appointed, well-placed, well-connected, well-endowed young man. His parents are dead. They have left him an inheritance, and there's nobody to restrain him. And he spends the entire book just gratifying his every urge at higher and higher and higher levels. First, he uh, seduces and beds and ultimately marries the wife of um, Wu Song's older brother. This is one of the great femme fatales of world literature, Pan Jinlian, uh, whose name we will have quite a lot to say about. Uh, that's in the first 10 chapters. In the next 10 chapters, he seduces and beds off the top of my head two or three more women. Um, he's already on wife number four when we meet him. By chapter 20, he will be on wife number six. Uh, 
And as the book goes on, he just keeps winning. He keeps getting everything he wants. He keeps succeeding in business. He keeps getting the better side of business deals. He keeps rising and advancing and going farther and farther and farther than anybody from his status, uh, his class background, anybody of his character should ever be able to do. And it looks like he's going to keep winning, but, but um, he doesn't. Uh, the way in which he loses is extraordinarily, uh, it's, it, it's, it's really memorable. Um, many of you will wince when you read it. Uh, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, it goes on after his downfall for another 20 chapters and charts the downfall of his household. Over the course of the book, as Xi Menqing has advanced in the outside world, has gone farther and farther and farther, his household has further, uh, fallen further and further into disrepair. His six wives are competing with each other for status and for his affections. Uh, they are constantly backbiting and lying and, and undermining one another uh, in ways that uh, are at first comic and ultimately quite tragic. That dissolution continues after his death, and the book ends not only with the collapse of the entire Ximen household and the, the very grim fates of its members, but with the fall of the Northern Song Dynasty as the Jurchens come riding over the border. I haven't spoiled anything here. Uh, this is important to say. One, because a Ming Dynasty audience knows what happens, as I said, with the Song Dynasty. They know about Jurchens. But also because under the logic of fiction and under the logic of kind of mainstream thought, this cannot possibly come to a good end. This is a, a society in which this can be allowed to happen is a society that is not fated for a good end. Um, Ximen Qing is not so much a cause as a symptom of a, a world that has gone very badly wrong. Uh, and when we pull the camera back from the events of the book to look at the circumstances of its composition, or at least the circumstances under which it was first read, we can see some pretty serious parallels to the late Ming Dynasty. As I say, the, the book is supposedly set during the Northern Song, but it's very transparently the Ming. There's not really any attempt to pretend otherwise. Uh, the first we hear of this is uh, a reference to a partial manuscript in 1596. Uh, the, the first printed edition isn't until, I think, 1617, 1618. Um, but in this course, as we're reading through the book, we're also going to be talking about the context, um, the historical context and the kind of intellectual context in which it's being read. So. Back to the slides quickly. Um, the late Ming is just a terrifically prosperous era, um, unprecedentedly so, in fact. Uh, it is urbanizing uh, at a rap clip. Uh, there is social mobility on a level that has never been seen before. Uh, it's possible even for the children of merchant parents to be prepared to take the exams and uh, eventually join the, the higher class of the scholars. Um, very little can be counted upon because it is a world that is undergoing rapid change. And although uh, the, the book itself is aware of this, although Chinese sources at the time don't think of it that way, we can also see this as the beginning of China getting linked into uh, an emerging global economy. Silver plays a massive role in this book. Uh, and some sizable portion of that silver was being mined by enslaved Indians in the New World, then carried on a Spanish galleon to Manila and ultimately traded to China for silks and porcelains. Uh, this takes place, the book takes place, and uh, sorry, the, the book takes place and the book was read, rather, in a world of stuff and a world of money. Uh, a world in which uh, almost anything was negotiable for a price. And that is what I think the, the book is ultimately um, 
motivate life. Those of you who have heard of Jinping Mei will have heard of its reputation um, as a work of just really fairly vile pornography. Um, I'm here to say that that is the least of it. Um, but it is what has kept this book from, I think, being recognized as the, the masterpiece that it is. Uh, the, sorry. Going back to the slideshow here. Um, the very first line of one of the prefaces to this is, the plum in the golden vase is an obscene book. Uh, this is how David Roy translates it. Um, those obscenities are most certainly not limited to sex. Those obscenities include the social crimes of which Xi Menqing and everybody in the book um, who comes into contact with him uh, are guilty of. That includes bribery, that includes subordination of justice, that includes uh, human trafficking, uh, also murder and uh, all kinds of other things, uh, including what would have been considered incest under Confucian norms. In this, it's reflecting the anxieties of a time. Here we've got uh, just a real bar of a quote from Zhang Tao in 1609. One man in a hundred is rich, while nine out of ten are impoverished. The poor cannot stand up to the rich, who, though few in number, are able to control the majority. The Lord of Silver rules heaven, and a lot of copper cash reigns over the earth. This is a reversal of the way things should be. Uh, this is um, quite simply uh, just an absolute, uh, yeah, a, an inversion, I should say, of uh, the proper social order. Money isn't supposed to control things. Uh, in the notional Confucian hierarchy, what you have is uh, best represented by the acronym SPAM, scholars, peasants, artisans, merchants. Uh, but in the late thing, the power of money and the attachment of price tags to just about everything, including spots in the National University, uh, left people reeling. Uh, it really messed them up. You can see that in quite a lot of the fiction of the time, but Jinping Mei is, uh, for my money, uh, just one of the best and most memorable statements of, uh, of this kind of shock and horror that people felt in a world that no longer behaved by the rules they had been brought up to expect. Um, to go back one last time to uh, the slides, um, we don't know who the author was, but we can make some assumptions about him, and we will do that during the course. Um, but fundamentally, what the author and what every one of his readers would have believed, uh, one of the cornerstones of their education and their worldview, would have been this passage from the Da Xue, the Great Learning. Uh, the ancients who wished to illustrate illustrious virtue, this is James Legg's translation, uh, throughout the kingdom, first ordered well their own states. Wishing to order well their states, they first regulated their families. Wishing to regulate their families, they first cultivated their persons. Wishing to cultivate their persons, they first rectified their hearts. Wishing to rectify their hearts, they first sought to be sincere in their thoughts. This is the exact opposite of what happens in Jinping Mei. What we have in Jinping Mei is a case of the fish rotting from the head down in the Ximen household as a microcosm for the empire as a whole. Uh, it's a, a book about the, the inversion, really, of moral cultivation. Instead of Xi Menqing uh, denying himself, saying no, and working on improving his own morality and ethics as one ought, he gives in to every single urge. He makes the people around him worse. Uh, rather than goodness and kind of charismatic moral virtue emanating outward from him, 
uh, as happens in the, the normal Confucian model. Instead, he's a, a plague. He makes the world worse, and everybody who comes into contact with him goes on to make the world worse, too. Um, it is a, a staggeringly dark vision. Which uh, brings us back to that Feng Meng Lung quote, uh, which I'll close on. Um, David Roy translated it as Jin Ping Mei is an obscene book. Uh, I would read it instead as The Plum in the Golden Vase is a book of obscenities. The obscenities that get remembered, the obscenities that kind of make the novel's reputation are the sexual ones. But as I say, that's less than 1% of the book. The obscenities that are, I am fairly sure in the author's mind, are social, are moral, uh, gustatory, even sartorial. Um, it's a portrait of a world that is falling apart. And sex is the least of it. Uh, we will talk about what the sex might be for, if not that. Um, so I think that uh, kind of brings me to the end of my spiel for uh, why the book matters and uh, why I, I, I would like more people to read it, uh, ideally with me, but if not, on your own. Um, but yeah, the, the question that I would like everybody to have in mind if we go into this class or if you read the book uh, elsewhere is, um, what kind of obscenities is Feng Malone talking about? Because um, it isn't just sex. Uh, yeah. Uh, with that, John, I will throw back to you. Oh, um, sorry, I'm not hearing you. I had my microphone muted while you were talking. I forgot to turn it back on. Um, so we have a few questions from uh, some of the people watching. So Haku asks, uh, or he says, uh, seems like every book about society shows mm -hmm. people being very poorly, undermining the myth that civilization eliminate, eliminates barbarism. Maybe it's time to stop society. Well, uh, okay, Zhuangzi. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, there, there is. Um, so uh, I would say the, the vision that's underlying this novel, um, our translator, David Roy, um, identifies it with Shinzi. That I, I'm not so sure about, but um, you know, for the author of this book, the problem isn't society. The problem is that society isn't societying hard enough or <laughs> it's societying the wrong way instead of the right way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, he also asks, what's the range of sexual activities covered in the text? It's broad. Uh, it is broad. It is not limited to hetero. Um, and it is also not entirely consensual. Hmm. Um, one of the reasons that I say this is not a work of pornography, um, and I, you know, I, I feel pretty confident in that, is that uh, as the book goes on, the sex becomes both less appealing to the reader and less satisfying for anybody involved in it. Um, it is as if, you know, Ximen Qing is on that hedonic treadmill and, you know, has the speed cranked up to 10. Um, and uh, even the language in which the book talks about sex changes. Um, you go from kind of very pretty, you know, butterflies and birds and whatever to uh, military metaphors or, you know, serpents or things like that. Um, but yes, the uh, the sex is there. Uh, it's not really supposed to be appealing, and um, I will be including kind of little warnings uh, when we're getting to episodes that are dicey, because there are scenes of really unpleasant sexual violence in this. Hmm. <clears throat> it sounds pretty bleak <laughs> as the novel goes along. There are good parts too. I'm not selling it, I realize, but um, no, it's uh, the best I can do is say the sex, which is mostly not appealing. Oh, I think we lost Brendan. I'm going to message him real quick. I can get him to rejoin the call. Um, <clears throat> Should have him back on in a sec.
Give me just a sec, guys. Running back on. All right, here we go. Let's see. <clears throat> Sorry about this, folks. He should be back on momentarily. I'm talking to him on uh, WhatsApp, so... <clears throat> Excuse me, he's trying to reconnect. Ah, there we go. Sorry, uh, am I back? And or although I think the camera's pointing elsewhere. Man, I was like, wait, uh... let me switch to FaceTime and back to. Huh. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, is the audio coming through for now at least? The audio is, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> sorry about that, everybody. Uh, things happen. Uh, so we did have, we can just go ahead with the questions. I don't think you need to spend too yeah, much. Yeah, sounds good. Um, we've got one. Do we ever feel sorry for him after his house is in shambles, or do we just loathe him? Ooh, uh... I mean, that is a question that ultimately you're going to have to answer for yourself. Uh, but I can say that you are not supposed to feel sorry for him. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel pretty, uh, pr pretty confident in that. Um, yeah. Um, but what's interesting to me, and actually I was talking to somebody about this the other day, um, this novel also uh, features one of the great femme fatales of Chinese literature, Pan Jin Lian. Um, now, you are not supposed to feel sorry for Pan Xinyan. There is absolutely zero, you know, 0.0% 0 .0 chance that the author intended you to feel bad for her. Mm. And yet, uh, the novel is so well written that there's actually room for you to do that. Uh, there are ways in which you can read it and, you know, kind of read it honestly, uh, just going by the text that's on the page, and come off with the sense that Pan Xingyan is, you know, yeah, she is a woman who has done some pretty terrible things, but she didn't have much of a choice. And uh, I, I think it's kind of a testament to the author's artistry that, you know, you can get things out of the book that were not intended. Mm -hmm. It's not merely didactic. Um, <clears throat> Monica also asks, would the common man have been able to access a copy of the book? Ooh. Uh, that is a really, really good question. Um, in, in a lot of ways, it's hard to give a definite answer. Um, we don't know a ton about book circulation. Uh, this got banned uh, throughout the Qing dynasty. The fact that it was banned means that it was being sold. Uh, so, um, you know, the, there were bans on it. How effective those bans were is is uncertain but we do know that say it's the the author of homo monk definitely read it we know that the commentators read it uh there's it it is a pretty safe bet that uh certainly the the literate classes after you know well after 16 18 16 20 or so uh those who had the money and the literacy and the time uh definitely could have uh, mostly gotten their hands on a copy. Now, before that, this circulated in manuscript for a couple of decades, and there's actually great debates among the early readers over whether they should publish it, because everybody says, like, this is genius. This is a this is a fantastic book. This is one of the best things I've ever read. We cannot let normal people get their hands on it. They will misunderstand it. They will lead themselves into perdition. Um, you know, and. Uh, Ultimately, it's probably Feng Menglong who plays some role in, in getting this commercially published first, and everybody's angry at him. Uh, the writer Shen De Fu actually says in an earlier note, like, yeah, someone said we should publish this. And I said, no, because, man, I don't want to have to answer for that when I'm facing the king of hell. <laughs> um, so... Uh, 
So that's uh, that's sort of a rambling answer. Um, could the ordinary person have gotten their hands on this? The ordinary person who you know had access to good books uh, had the money to buy, probably buy rather than borrow. Um, probably the answer is yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. <clears throat> a related question, uh, Teresa asks: Is this book read in China? Uh, surreptitiously and in heavily expurgated format. Mm, um, I would think. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've got, I, I've got a couple of print copies of this that I bought in China, and I, you know, some are. I think one is complete, and one is just really badly botched. Um, but there are uh, there are other kind of difficulties too. There are two major editions of, of this text. Uh, the version that we're going to be reading is the so-called Tsihua edition, or sometimes called the Wanli edition. Uh, this was believed to be an earlier version of the text. Uh, it probably is, but the, the dating on these is not that great. Um, the version of it that most people read was actually a later one. It's the so-called Chongzhen edition. Uh, that's the one that really had the major impact on, um, uh, on literary history. Uh, it would be really nice if we had a good translation of that. But uh, instead, we've got Roy's version, which uh, is uh, it, it's, it is an amazing translation. It's the distillation of a lifetime of scholarship. Um, but it is not the version that, say, Cao Xue Qin read. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, let's see. We've got quite a few questions, actually. Uh, Randy asks, what's the main character? Mm -hmm. That's uh, Xi Men Qing. Type it in the chat. Xi Men Qing, yes. As in, yeah, thanks. It's uh, as in Westgate and Celebrate. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, we will also have occasion to talk about that name because there is one theme in which that name is uh, code for the original target of this novel. Okay. Um, Anthony asks, uh, what part of China is it set in? So it's set in the, uh, the town of Qinghe, which is located uh, somewhere in Shandong. Or it's actually probably on, like, in between Shandong and Hebei, uh, going by modern day boundaries. Um, so northeast. That said, uh, Northeast, but that said, like a lot of the geography of the the town corresponds probably to Ming Beijing, um, and you know the the place itself is on the Grand Canal, and that's the most important thing. There is a lot of trade passing through this town. Okay. Um, Haku asks, doesn't Hong Mong uh, contain its fair amount of sex scenes yet? Is it considered pornographic? Yeah, um, Hong Lo Meng does not contain any sex scenes that are quite this uh, graphic or, you know, in, in some cases, actually pretty brutal. Um, mm. You know, Hong Lo Meng is, uh, it, it's a romantic book, uh, or at least there's there's a uh, reading in which it's a romantic book. Um, Jin Ping Mei is... It's deeply misogynistic, but it's profoundly misanthropic. I think above all else. Okay. Uh, Bernard uh, says bands usually make books more popular. That's definitely the truth. <laughs> yeah, was it? Uh, I, it might be an apocryphal quote. I think it was Voltaire. Um, somebody, upon eating ice cream for the first time, said, "Like how perfectly delicious! What a shame it isn't illegal." <laughs> you know, like, how could you improve on this? That sounds like Voltaire. Um, Randy mentions a Baidu which brings up lots of material, inclu including movie adaptations and discussions. Oh, yeah, there are uh, there are Hong Kong um, category three films, uh, which uh, I have not seen, um, but perhaps a friend of mine has. Uh, no. Um, there, there have been uh, 
adaptations of this, but to the best of my knowledge, there have not been any serious adaptations. Um, the ones that I know about, and admittedly, I have not looked uh, too far into this, but the ones that I know of uh, were basically skin flicks out of Hong Kong. Uh, I think there were also Japanese manga and, and like... I'm sure, yeah. <clears throat> um, it would be, right? Yeah. Uh, Marguerite says, how do you intend to teach the book? Oh, that's a, that's a good hey. question. I'm doing this one a little bit differently. Right? Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. And hey, it is very good to hear from you. Um, so the plan for this, uh, I had initially thought um, that we would do this 10 chapters per week. And then I realized that that was nuts, that that was like a pace that would be inhumane even for a grad student. Um, so instead, we we're going to do this uh, at a rate of 10 chapters every two weeks. Um, and it's going to be sort of a tick tock cadence where one week uh, we'll do sort of rundown of you know what has happened in the last 10 chapters. Uh, what are some things that you know might be worth going back and taking a second look at? And one nice thing about this book is because it is authored and because it is uh, very finely structured, it actually falls into 10 chapter segments. Uh, something you'll notice as you read it is that it tends to be 10 chapter segments, some kind of climax or twist in chapter seven, and then a day new mountain set up for the next 10 chapters. Anyway, we'll be doing this uh, approximately five chapters a week. Uh, on alternate weeks, there will be the rundown of events in the book. And then on alternating weeks, I will be putting up several short videos about background, either uh, literary background to some of the things that are being referred to in the text, or some of the historical and intellectual background. So we might do, you know, like 10 minutes on the global silver trade, or five minutes on sumptuary laws, just so you know, like what crime people are committing. Uh, there will be a lot of things to say about gender and class, um, and really quite a lot to say about the sort of dissolution of the late Ming. Um, why did people feel like it was coming to a close? And why ultimately uh, did it fall apart 50 years later in actually more or less the way predicted in the book? Uh, it's not Jurchens, it's Manchus, but you know it is northern barbarians coming over that border. Oh, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I know there. <clears throat> it's really interesting how things have worked out in the last couple of courses because the middle period history, as I mentioned earlier, is going on, and they were just they're talking about the Jurchens like now. I mean, they you know, um, mm. and then there's been some overlap <clears throat> with the classical course too. So it, it's worked out really nicely that there's you know a lot of um, sort of overlap and interplay between the different courses going on. Uh, Haku I mean, the Jurchens are like such a, a genuinely traumatic thing, right? Like, you lost to those guys. That's not supposed to happen. Uh, and, you know, I, I kind of feel like people might not have really known what to do about that, you know? Yeah. And that, of course, becomes a, <clears throat> a major sort of recurring theme over the course of the you know, the second millennium. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with the Jurchens, I mean, the, the Manchus who do ultimately come over that border in 1644 were initially called the Hou Jin, mm -hmm. that is the, you know, the later Jurchens. And it's only later that they changed the name to the Qing. Uh, incidentally, that Qing, uh, the name's not a coincidence, right? They come in and call themselves clean uh, because the late Ming really was pretty dirty. Um, Haku, you mentioned, you ask about recommended readings. Uh, yeah. It, maybe he's talking about, um, about the different, you know, societal things during the course, maybe possibly. Is that what you mean, Haku? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will, uh, absolutely recommend stuff on that for, uh, general, uh, like single volume, pretty quick Yanming history, uh, I would strongly recommend Tim Brooke. I think it's uh, The Troubled Empire. Uh, that's his entry in the, uh, the whatever it is, the Harvard uh, History of China series that I think he and um, Mark Elliott co-edited. Uh, that one is excellent. Uh, getting into um, 
kind of commodity fetishes around the late Ming, uh, also by Tim Brooke, uh, The Confusions of Pleasure is really good. Uh, but yeah, I, I will uh, be very happy to post recommendations um, as we go kind of subject by subject. Yeah, yeah that's a good recommendation. The, <clears throat> so guys, the uh, the Harvard series he's mentioning, I don't have the, the Brooke volume, uh, but this is the first volume in the okay. series. Early Chinese Emperor Qi Minh Han, uh, but the whole it goes all the way up to the Qing Dynasty, right? So, um, yes, yeah, yeah, and, and I every one of those I've read has been really good. Um, and I, I'm sorry, it was Mark Edward Lewis, not Mark Elliot. Um, uh, right, I guess Mark Elliot. I think he did the the Qing Dynasty volume, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, I think that was Ro, but I, I couldn't swear to it. Um, I've got that in storage. It's not here at the office. Um, something else. Oh, and then, uh, well, I can't find my book now. But the, the, the book that they're reading in the Middle Period History course is also, it goes up through the, uh, the end of the Qing Dynasty. So <clears throat> there would be, oh, nice. they won't go that far in that course, but there is some material that they've already got. Um, huh. uh, Rutledge History. Uh, and so uh, the, oh, the Cambridge, was it? Uh, Rutledge. Rutledge, huh. Uh, I don't know, but, I mean, to be honest, my history is lousy. <laughs> well, I can't find it. I've, I've got it here somewhere. I'm just not sure where I put it. So, um, But yeah, if I remember right, it goes all the way up to the Qing Dynasty, so that would also be a good sort of supplementary reading for this course. Mm. Uh, Let's see, will we be provided with PDFs of required reading for each week, or do we have to purchase a copy of the book? Uh, you do need a copy of the book. Um, I should say, or rather I shouldn't say, floating around, but um, <clears throat> yeah, you do need... Actually. Yeah, I, you know... It is something that's still in print. Yeah, I, I would say uh, it, it's, it's still in print. Um, you know, Princeton is supposedly working on a student edition of the Roy translation oh. it will be one volume and only use Han Yu Pinyin uh, I don't know when it's coming out I really would love to be teaching with it uh, but no as is I, I am sorry to say and unfortunately my camera has gone out or I would show you the kind of doorstop uh, <laughs> We're going to be reading using the David Roy translation, uh, which is industrial strength. It is five volumes, each of which could stun an ox. Um, it's really intimidating looking. Don't worry, we'll get through it. It's mostly end notes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are a hundred chapters in, in this and it's, you know, it, it's not a short book. Yeah, uh, and it is a 20-week a course, so... <clears throat> That's a, it's a pretty good clip. It's very doable, much more so than the 10 chapters a week that we were originally thinking. Oh, 10, it, 10 a week would have been the Baton Death March, man. That would have been fun for nobody. <laughs> yep. All right, cool. I think we've gotten through, <laughs> Bernard says, five door stops. Um, yeah. I think we've gotten uh, questions. Let me just kind of scroll back through and make sure. Uh, but assuming yeah. and um, go yeah. ahead and uh, you know as always um, please do email me if uh, you know if you have any questions that we didn't get to or if anything occurs to you um, would you mind putting my email up on screen John uh, burning house oh yeah let me um, pull up something that I can uh, type on oh sure sorry about that no, no, I just uh, didn't have something ready. Let's see. Uh... All right, let's see. Hopefully this will work. Nope. <laughs> uh, let's see. It, so briefly, though, for yeah. one tiny moment, it did. Not that. Yeah. I don't know. Where is it? Here we go. Nope, not that. 
Oh, what a mess. Okay. Oh, the joys of screen sharing. There we go. Oh, lovely. Thank you. There we go. So yeah, this is uh, Brennan's. Uh, hopefully, I'm not showing any uh, secrets about upcoming courses here on the left hand side. It didn't look like I am. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this is uh, Brennan's email address if you want to get in touch with him. Also, there's a, a sign up link for the course uh, in the description of this video. Um, let's see. I think that covers it. So, oh, Randy asked David who translation, but for everyone, it is David. Yes, uh, it is. Yes, thank you. Yeah, David Todd Roy. Um, this it, it is a monumental translation, and I'm not just talking about the way that um, it. It really is just a lifetime of of thought and research and very good scholarship yeah. um, in these books. <clears throat> Cool. Brennan, thanks for coming. Sorry, everybody, about the camera issues. Uh, these things. Yeah, that, sorry about that. But... That's the nature of live yeah, stuff. But... We're not a big deal. But yeah, thanks. And, uh, you know, just, uh, hope to see some of you there. And, uh, you know, yeah. even if you don't join with me, I, I hope you will read this book. It is so good. It really is. All right. Thank, thanks for your time, Brennan. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'll go ahead and end it here and hope to see you guys in the course. Uh -huh.